Now you wouldn't mistake the Atari 800 for a modern PC, but it wouldn't look that out of place sitting in a forgotten corner in your local library. Nothing about its design feels truly off-putting due to the passage of time. That is not true for the Atari 400, the entry-level model Atari was selling at the same time. This thing looks a lot more strange. Hi, I'm Jacob with Tech Retrospective, and this is the Atari 400. Before we get into it, please make sure to check out our Patreon and join our Discord server. Buying a computer in 1979 was a big ordeal, with home computers being sold by companies like Radio Shack, Apple, and Commodore. Atari had to do something special to court novice consumers to chase them, a game company. Atari tackled this by releasing not one, but two computers. A premium high-end model, which was at least as good, if not better than pretty much every other system available at the time, but it was quite expensive. And a budget model featuring the same great graphics and sound capabilities while cutting features down that wouldn't matter to gamers or those looking for a starter system to learn basic programming. This strategy was relatively new for computer platforms, but it has lived on decades later in everything from phones to modern game consoles to smart fridges. Although research and development costs for Atari's first computers were astronomically high, Atari was confident that their system would dominate the computer market filled with low-power Apple IIs and TRS-80s especially the 400 due to its appealing price and Atari's great library of first-party arcade conversions. I went into this in more detail in our 800 video, which you can check out here, uh, but the platform Atari built with these systems was incredibly impressive. Even at their most basic versions, they can rival, and some argue can even best, the Commodore 64, which wouldn't be released for another three years. Compared to the competition, Atari had a brand that normal consumers already trusted due to the 2600, and they had the best library of arcade games to convert any company could possibly have at the time. And they had a ton of media hype built up to a boiling point as the development of this platform continued. The 400 specifically was targeted as a great system for kids between its unique, let's say, keyboard and its lowered price, it would be a no brainer for parents to buy it to put in their kid's bedroom. And before you know it, boom, little Jimmy is a computer wizard, which is good because I heard Walter Cronkite say last night that computers are going to be important for our kids when they have the jobs of the future. Surely for years to come, the first word anyone would think of when they thought of a computer would be Atari. But then the prices were announced. Yikes. Well, maybe that's a bit too dramatic. People knew these revolutionary machines would be expensive and were used to paying prices in that same price range for the competition. But Atari had promised to truly make the computer a household item, and at those prices it was going to be an uphill battle. What made them so expensive, though? The price was so high on these systems due to both the forward-thinking technology, which required quite a few custom chips on board, and strict regulations on RF emissions from the FCC which made Atari have to conceal the system inside of a full metal case. Between 1979 and their discontinuation, the Atari 400 and 800 sold roughly 2 million units, which is pretty decent, but nowhere near market domination. At least 60% of those sales were specifically for the Atari 400, which by the end had been reduced in price to just $150, which was much more reasonable, but newer, cheaper machines like the VIC-20 kind of stole its thunder. Over the years, many different systems would be released as Atari's new entry-level computer, filling the bottom end of the market. 
but they'd see diminishing returns due to the industry's rapid technological improvements and race towards the bottom on prices. The 600XL would replace the 400 in 1983 to put it in line with the Commodore 64, which would then be replaced by the 65E in 85, which was essentially last gen's high-end system, the 800XL, in an Atari ST styled case which would then sort of be replaced by the Atari XE game system, which was trying to be uh, an NES and a Easter basket wrapped in one? I don't know. It's so odd to see Atari, who were years ahead in computer design, constantly play catch up for the entire life of the 8-bit line. But between computers just being seen as a side project for the company, and both turbulence in the market and in Atari itself, it's not really surprising. Now it's not all doom and gloom. The computer line was a success, just not a massive one. And the 400 itself is a really cool system, with some serious tech behind it. It's worth noting there are many different configurations for the 400 since Atari continued to work on the system and make improvements through the four years it was on sale. So to keep things simple, we're going to talk about what's under the hood with the original launch model of the system. After all, that's the configuration that was blowing minds in 1979. Later configs were better, but not as impressive to the public. The Atari 400 contains a MOS 6502 processor running at 1.8 megahertz, eight kilobytes of RAM with a maximum of 48K, the CTIA video processor able to display up to 128 colors at 160 by 96, and a pokey sound chip with four voices, two internal expansion slots, four controller ports, and one cartridge port for all your favorite games. Now let's talk about the differences from the 400 to the 800, besides, of course, the $500 price difference. Both systems shared the same processor and chipset, so performance-wise, especially for cartridge games, there's next to no difference. The 400 is somewhat smaller and only offers one cartridge port versus the 800's two. Another difference is in RAM. Both systems launched with the same amount of RAM, 8K. But by 1983, the 400 sold with 16K and the 800 a massive maxed out 48K. Last and probably most notable is the keyboard. While the 800 features a pretty standard quality keyboard from its time with a key feel that's reminiscent of a typewriter, the 400 includes Atari's innovative membrane, child-proof keyboard. It was designed to still work with kids' peanut butter-covered hands. And I hate it. <laughs> I really do. It also happens to be a much cheaper mechanism, and yeah, it feels pretty terrible to use, but when your goal is just to play games with a joystick on the system, it really doesn't matter. Now for the ratings. Rarity gets a 2 out of 5. The system sold over a million units. It's pretty common. Price gets a 4 out of 5. The membrane keyboard does turn some people off, so these systems can be picked up for pretty cheap, but you may want to pick up a later Atari system for about the same price. Aesthetics get a 3 out of 5. Objectively, the 800 has a much better aesthetic, but the 400 still has some charm and the unique factor of its strange keyboard. Software gets a four out of five. There's a very good amount of software available for this system, though some newer software for later Atari 8-bit computers won't be compatible. Ease of repair gets a four out of five. There is a good amount of resources available for this system. They also have really solid build quality, so there aren't very many hardware faults. Well, that's all I have for you guys today, so please make sure to subscribe. Let me know if you've ever used an Atari 400. Do you hate the keyboard as much as I do? Would you rather have an Atari 800? Let me know in the comments below. 
Uh, of course, join our Discord server. You can also support us on Patreon to help us uh, continue to grow. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.